Okay, right. We're um, back for our second interview panel of the evening. Um, right, I'm going to hand it over to Georgie. I hope you've all had a chance to stretch your legs and grab a cup of tea or something. And um, we will start off with Emma Swan. But I'll um, hand over to Georgie and let you take the lead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Emma. Uh, hello. Emma from Thrive Safe. This looks like a fascinating venture. Just explain what Thrive Safe is. Uh, so it's a company focused on raising awareness on domestic abuse, sexual violence, and mental health, with a specific focus on kind of workplace well-being. Looking at taking a really proactive stance in kind of approaching the topic. So generally, I have a stance that if people don't know about it that's good because you're not been through it. So rather than it being like a lecture, it's about creating like really positive, open, like judgment free spaces to kind of just make really difficult conversation a lot easier to navigate and kind of take a really proactive stance on addressing kind of the need that people have because the numbers are quite high. So uh, yeah, just trying to do what we can to open the conversation. And I know that recently you've taken the leap as you described it in your questionnaire, taken a big leap and you've become self-employed. There is just you in this yeah. business. You don't employ anybody else. So um, how do you deliver the this training or these talks or these one-to-one -one sessions with companies when it is just you? Or do you get people in, subcontract people in? No, so it's just me. Um, it's a mixture of online and face to face. So kind of depends what people want to do. So it's completely bespoke. So that's kind of the whole point is that it's flexible for any size company. Um, when I set it up, I never wanted to ostracize a certain type of company. Uh, you know, if there's someone that's like two persons big and that's it then that's fine. It's a different type of service. So if they want me to come and see them, then that's fine. Um, but also, I don't want to rule out any areas. So I, I deliver nationally. So if it's online, then we can use obviously all the modern day technology, which the pandemic ironically has been a bit of a blessing for that because the world is suddenly mm. so much more um, fluid in how they communicate. Yeah. So it makes it a lot more accessible. So it's just a mixture really of kind of how people want it, whether that's face to face or online. Um, yeah, it varies. I know you've been influenced by your dad and um, and was it your uncle as well uh, who uh, have their own business? Uh, yeah. Was it always important to you to work for yourself? Because you did describe it. You say you're loving it, um, but it is a big leap. So Yeah, it's like uh, I think they've always been like an inspiration because my granddad had a big company that was very well known in the town called Starlines that was um, unfortunately – also profile because it got, it got burnt down so it was quite a lot of paper and they used to have this Christmas jingle um, and it was like kind of a bit of a big part of our childhood knowing about that and then my dad and our uncle set up their company and they've been you know quite successful they're kind of well known they engage a lot in the community so the aspirations already always been there to do more as much as possible I think the work ethic has been just bred into me more than anything so um it's like a leap in the sense of like that vulnerability of um, being completely accountable to yourself. Like I've always worked in big organisations where I can just do my job and get on with what I need to do. Whereas obviously now I've got to be HR and marketing and sales and deliver and everything all in one. So that's a yeah. little bit. Of, that's kind of the leap, really, is all those bits. But um, yeah, I'm not shy of the work, thankfully. So it's uh, yeah, it's kind of. I've worked in public, private and voluntary sector. So I've kind of done all those industries now and kind of going, just try and do what I can in it, really. When you are, when it is just you, you mentioned there, you've got to be HR, you've got to be marketing, you've got to be sales, you've got to be everything. You've got to wear so many hats. Do you, um, do you feel that you, um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, someone's singing here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's very jolly, I like it. It's very I'm just chairing the uh, it was a small business association meeting. <laughs> they can't see us. Um, do, so you've got to wear all those hats for uh, for your business. Are there any areas that you've struggled with? Uh, I kind of think the oh. difference is the sales side of it, in the sense that in my previous roles, as much as I've gone 
to loads of communities or got into like businesses um, like representing the organizations I've been in so like got into like, education providers or social care teams or external partners and I talk and do all those kind of things I need to but my role is still quite covert in those positions because you're not you know when you're supporting high-risk survivors you're not really meant to be that well known as as yourself so now kind of going to people and being like oh you might need me and being quite gentle about it I'm having to kind of really learn how to market myself in that way that's a bit more kind of over and a bit more present so it's it's all just learning it my dad always says every day is a school day that's like his number one thing he's always said so little but it's everything literally every day is a school day in fact at the moment every hour is a school, new school day every, so every hour is a school day yeah uh, do you think that the pandemic has made it worse in terms or more pertinent in terms of companies needing what you provide i'm thinking particularly the mental health and uh, aspect of what you do yeah massively i think to be honest it's kind of one of the biggest drivers why i just went fully solo with it was because the numbers are shocking like you know there's been a massive study recently that's shown that generally it's between 42 and 49 pound billion impact to the uk alone economy so we're talking billions not millions and two-thirds of that is in presenteeism so people actually turning up to work when they're not really well or not performing at their best. And so there's a lot of hidden sickness in the workplace. And we know there's hidden harms of abuse. We know that domestic abuse has gone up significantly. We know that 60% of adults are saying that their mental health has got worse in the pandemic, 68% for children. So we know that actually this coming out of the pandemic is so essential that workplaces are kind of really open to the fact that staff are coming back with a lot of needs and people who might have been otherwise mind healthy are coming back quite anxious and quite stressed and they might have been through more trauma, witnessed it. And it's just kind of trying to get people to just be a bit more compassionate in understanding that whatever's happened in the last 18 months for you has not been the same for everybody else, really. Lovely. Thank you, Emma. I think we need to wrap that one up, don't we, Marie? We do, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. That's, Thank um, you. Yeah, another, yeah. another fascinating one. So, yeah. right, okay. we've now got Tony Southgate from Generate Leads Online. So I will leave you enjoy. Hello, Tony. Hi, Georgie. You OK? Hi. Yes, very, very well. So Generate Leads Online. Um, the thing that struck me about this, looking at your questionnaire, was you said uh, how much uh, you hated cold calling and uh the business with the uh john who was uh who was in sales also hated cold calling uh and you wanted to do something where companies didn't have to do it um personally i've never thought that cold calling works uh because if ever i've been cold called for anything i don't really give them the time of day i've always found it very intrusive um so how does this differ and and offer something different to what I've always considered to be a sales technique that just alienates people uh well I think uh, certainly with with cold calling and, and James will probably be great to talk about this with uh sales masters um it's a technique that does still work but I think as sales people we, we probably don't really enjoy because of that rejection uh, and so the reason that the business was started in the first instance is John and I both have a sales background. John started the business by himself before I joined him uh, full time. But um, wanting to eliminate the need of having to cold call uh, and be able to get businesses found for what they do. And so then the leads are incoming and they're warm leads and they're people that are looking for the products and services that you offer. Uh, and then that way they can contact you, which then makes that telephone call after they've done that contact um, a lot easier uh, because, you know, they're already interested in what you're offering. So how do you generate leads online then? How do you do it? I guess um, one, one of the things that makes us uh, different to other agencies, uh, which I've had experience with in the past, is the... Um, it's around SEO and websites. So probably all business owners here have, have got a website. Uh, that website is probably really beautiful looking, but the website isn't much use unless it can be found online. And whenever we build a website, we want to make sure that all of the search engine optimization work, the keyword research, all the right information in the right place is done from the outset. 
So when someone searches for you by your business name or what you do, uh, your website and your pages can be found. Uh, that way they come through to the website and then we make sure we use conversion rate optimization to make sure that those people coming through can quickly and easily make contact with you or find the information that they need uh, in order to then make contact. Now, you said your biggest challenge is sustainable growth and, and going from um, being marketeers and leaders and, and still trying to know everything we need to know about marketing. You're one of the few people that hasn't cited COVID as their biggest challenge. Um, but was it? Uh, no, so, I mean, COVID was great for us because of um, bricks and mortar locations having to close their doors and people having mm -hmm. to adapt their business model in order to uh, be able to be found and sell their products and services online. So what it meant for us is that we were able to go through a period of sustainable growth as um, those businesses that realised that their website wasn't fit for purpose in the way that they needed to trade and online trading has increased year on year and it's kind of sped up the amount of people that are now buying online. Um, so I think as business owners, so John and I, uh, fantastic marketeers, we know loads about digital marketing and we're able to talk about it and perform it until the cows come home. Um, but what that means is that our team has grown. Uh, we've taken on a lot of new staff. We've gone from three full-time members of staff. We're now up to 10 which means that our skills in digital marketing aren't as important as our skills in building a culture, vision, values, mission, uh, and all of those things. So it's, it's taken a, a different turn for us in, you know, being able to look after John himself, myself as a freelancer, one employee, and then suddenly we're responsible for all of these uh, people, their careers, their development, which is, is probably been our biggest challenge. Mm. Tell me about the dig digital skills gap. You talk about this on, on your questionnaire and you say it costs the UK an extraordinary amount of money. What is the digital skills gap and why is it a problem? I'm glad you asked me, Georgie. It's almost as if I asked you to. Um, <laughs> it's something which I'm incredibly passionate about. So my background is also in learning and development. So I worked for regional publisher, Archon, so you guys will know East Anglia yep. Daily Times. Um, the digital skills gap is a massive problem for the UK, uh, and there's a double-edged sword to this. Um, so there's people that work in industry and have worked in business in a long time. And when they started their business, websites and the internet didn't even exist. Uh, so that means that they're at risk. And as an agency, we have not always been perfect and we've not always got it right. But one of the things I want to make sure that we do is whenever we work with a business, they're educated and they understand what it is that they're buying. So every business owner that I speak to has probably got a story to tell around how they've been burnt for money. And it's so easy for someone to masquerade as a digital specialist and sell you a website for £50,000, but that website may not be fit for purpose. So one of the problems is making sure that business owners can get up to speed in what it is that they're buying, understand what good looks like and what works and what doesn't. The other side to it is the people that are coming through to work in this industry. So we work with Kickstarters, apprentices, people that have been through digital marketing degrees, but they don't have the skills that are needed to run effective digital marketing. Uh, so that, the two things combined, you know, with a business owner that doesn't really understand digital, with someone that's new to the industry, doesn't understand it digital, means that businesses, you know, could potentially spend thousands of pounds of their money on marketing that doesn't actually work. So by making sure that there is this gap, so agencies, brands that get these apprentices, skill them up property, properly, give them the support that they need, but also making sure that these agencies educate their clients in digital marketing so they truly understand what they're giving, uh, what they're getting, uh, mm. that will then help prevent, you know, all these horror stories of people being ripped off and it will help the workforce that's coming through to be better skilled and be able to plug the gap and understand what it is that people ne now need to do in order to market their business effectively. Thank you, Tony. That was great. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Right, we've now got James Davies, Sales Masters Guild. I will hand you over to Georgie. 
Hello, James. Hello, Georgie. Hello, Sales Masters Guild. Uh, personal business mentoring uh, for business owners uh, who find, particularly who find themselves at a crossroads. That's the expression you used. First of all, tell me about mentoring. Why do you consider mentoring in business so important? Okay. Um, I've had 40 years experience in business. There aren't many things I haven't come across. Um, in fact, I started off in business before computers existed and nobody had heard of the internet. Um, but we come across them in our, uh, in our business life and learn to use them. Um, but if you're just starting out in business or perhaps uh, you've been in business for a while, but you've come to a point where uh, you feel that you're not growing any further, um, then as a mentor, I can help people like that using my experience um, to help them move themselves forward um, and, in, in, and get what it is they're looking for from their business. How would you sell that to another business? Because much like when I spoke to David about the, the cyber security, mm. um, it is possibly something that businesses might say, I can't afford to do. I'm going to, oh, I need to look into that. I'm going to put that on the back burner. How do you sell to them that this is really important, that it's something they really need? Well, the simple answer to that is I wouldn't try and sell to them because they're not my customer. My customer is somebody who knows they need help and uh, they're prepared to um, put the, the, the resource behind it in order to uh, to move themselves forward. Uh, so it's ambitious people I'm looking for. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's people who have made a decision that they actually want to take this seriously and move their business forward. Um, I mean, I would also say to someone, well, you know, what's the cost of not doing it? If at the moment you're in a position where you're not making the money that you think you ought to be making, uh, your business isn't moving forward the way you would want it to, what's the cost of staying in that position compared with the cost of taking on some advice to help you um, with your business and the, the benefits that you can get from that? What kind of crossroads do people come to that where you could help them? I'm just thinking of some examples. Well, a very yeah, common maybe, thing would be taking on your first employee. Yeah. Um, and people go into business on their own. Um, uh, they, they do what, uh, what they do and they probably do it very well. Um, but uh, one of the, the blockers to growth is that uh, if you are the person delivering all the time for your customers, you haven't got time to develop the business. And you really need to uh, develop a kind of uh, schizophrenic mindset, if you like. You've got to be three people. You've got to be the entrepreneur who's building the vision for the business and moving it forward, as Tony was saying a little bit earlier. You also have to be the manager who is uh, managing all the resources that uh, your business has got and pointing them in the right direction. And you've also got to be the technician that's delivering to the customer. And part of that transition is to accept that perhaps you shouldn't be the technician any longer. Perhaps you should be employing two or three other people to do the delivery and you should be spending your time focused on building the business and moving it forward. So that's a, a very typical crossroads. I think it's what Emma was saying as well about having to wear loads of different hats. Absolutely. And sometimes you get to a point where yeah. you just can't wear that many hats anymore yeah. and you've got to work on the business of the business itself. Yes. Sure. Um, and it's a conflict and a lot of people find it really difficult. Because actually the role they're probably most comfortable in is technician. Yeah. You Now, on your questionnaire, you're very open and honest about having suffered a business failure yourself. But you mm -hmm. actually, I get the impression from what your, your answers, you've used that as a motivational thing uh, for yourself, for your business and for other businesses as well to say, I haven't always got it right. Mm -hmm. um, but I've learned from that. How difficult has it been to be that honest with yourself <laughs> and clients to say, look, I've, I'm using this as an yeah. example of what can and go wrong? I feel perfectly comfortable talking to clients about it. Um, talking to myself about it was the more difficult one. Um, I mean, my business failure came about because of something that was outside of my control and it happened to me. Um, 
I think I put up a pretty good fight and I did the best I possibly could to keep the business uh, um, going. Um, at the end of the day, I had to uh, accept that I wasn't going to make it. Um, so I changed my uh, um, uh, my priorities, if you like, and uh, made sure that I did the best for everybody that worked for me and nobody lost a job, which was amazing out of 80 people that worked for me at the time. Um, and I feel quite comfortable with that. Um, was that easy? No. I probably spent the next six months under the duvet saying life shit and I'm really, you know, it's unfair and it's not right and all this sort of stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, I came out and said, right, well, it's now up to me to do something and uh, um, try and use that experience to help other people. And uh, it was at a difficult time in the, uh, the UK economy. A lot of businesses were struggling. So I, I went to, went out to try and help people um, that found themselves in difficulty and help them navigate through it. Um, the environment changed after that and uh, um, it became more of a growth uh, focus in the, in the economy. So uh, I then morphed that from business uh, uh, recovery, if you like, to uh, uh, to business growth. Um, and, you know, part of the, the skill of running your own business is knowing when to change direction. And uh, that's what I've done. I should imagine that uh, the people you're mentoring find that very refreshing and candid and quite inspirational, actually, that you can say, I was rock bottom. And mm. but it's perfectly doable to change course, change track and make a, a success. Uh, James, thank you. That's, uh, well, that's not really, only really... is it doable, it's essential. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes, absolutely. Because the world changes and you have to change with it, preferably just ahead of it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, we've talked a lot about that tonight, haven't we, about being ahead of the, the curve mm. and ahead of trends and so forth. Uh, James, thank you. Thank you. You're Lovely. very welcome. Thanks, James. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, it's been, I think they've all been really, really good tonight. Really interesting. Um, we've got one more to go. Bob, last but not least. And um, that's Bob Scott, Niche Cocktail. And I will hand over to you. Hello, Bob. Hello, uh, good friend. evening. We're going to talk about booze, which is one of my yes, favourite subjects. Um, started well, you've been trading eight and a half years, and started off uh, as an event business. But you've um, developed and changed, and thought about where else your product can go in. That's been quite a theme tonight about people having to roll with the punches yeah. and and so forth. Um, you've got some big future plans for the business yeah. which are exciting but um tell me about I mean, we can't it's you know we, we have to talk about it we tell me about the pandemic because a lot of people um were drinking more <laughs> at home um so how did it affect you right um when we set this up i'll go back a, a step or so um i set up the event business eight and a half years ago and uh, we did a lovely christmas event for his bar a few years ago which i think james had to guess the cocktails if i'm if i'm um remembering <laughs> correctly and um they're yeah, quite an exciting evening uh, uh and marie won something and all those good things and all this i was always thinking why am i selling somebody else's drink, why can't I sell my own? And it was always in the back of my mind. Very fortunate, about three years ago, met um, Paddy Bishop from Paddy and Scott's Coffee. He set up um, Shout About Suffolk in Melton, and we sat down and we thought, right, okay, we're not going to put stuff in bottles, we're going to put it in cans. And that's exactly what we've done, because we've got Latitude, which is a yeah. place that's basically glass that so you can't take glass in there you can't take glass into a lot of exhibitions as well such as xl if you go in there it's got to be plastic or tins it it's been an interesting journey so we started off with three products um three products should i say we had an old-fashioned whiskey sour and a margarita which we thought this is great we launched it valentine's day last year absolutely fantastic march the 23rd it stopped because we yeah. had everybody bring everything back and say, well, we're not open. Can you um, can you take it back? Which we did. And then we thought, what do we do? Um, it didn't have a timeline on it. So we didn't know when we were going to be able to maintain our sales in the on-trade. So, of course, we went online, e-commerce. 
it probably took about six weeks to get the website up and running as it is now and it's proved to be something that we might have done we've now actually done it and, yeah. and it's worked an tr- absolute treat because um both retail and trade can look at the website look at the products we um have an interesting um situation where we have these little gift packs which go down very well for not just for christmas but for businesses to actually um send to their clients yeah. to actually say thank you um so we've had to switch from well we are now starting to go back to restaurants pubs clubs trains and planes but we've had to go at a different angle we had no choice but i think if we hadn't gone online like a lot of people uh we wouldn't be here now but we've got huge plans yes well you have indeed and it's interesting that the pandemic forced your hand yeah. as it were like yeah. you say we might have done it done that eventually but you <sighs> had to um and did you find that a lot of people were, you know, ordering because they were at home and stuck at home? And I mean, we did all, well, I'll put my hand up and say we did hit the old red wine bottle a little bit. Well, none of us had to go to work. <laughs> well, actually, I did. But, um, but yeah, did you find that people were treating themselves to luxury what? items like this? What was the bonus for last year, and I don't know how it's going to pan out this year, is that there were no pubs, clubs, restaurants open. So firms no. couldn't hold their Christmas party. No. So what they did, they sent some of our cocktails to their staff. They sometimes arranged food, or the people would arrange food. And there was an enormous amount of Zoom Christmas mm. parties going on, yes. literally right through from the second week of December right through. So we were able to help um, contribute towards that our products had increased then we then got 10 or 12 cocktails you could choose from and i think that people were quite surprised to get something from their bosses that they could they could still get together i mean if you think you know we we'd sort of um had come out started a party what was it six limited to six then 30 then six then yeah. boxing day all closed down again yeah it, it's been an interesting time if we have helped people um, put a smile on their face if we've helped people enjoy themselves and we've got a, a mocktail range as well so you don't have to drink oh god if you don't want to so it mm-hmm. uh you know it's broadened the range but this year is going to be interesting and i know that still looking at the event side of things you've got uh, staff parties you've got parties the numbers are down where maybe they might have had 80 90 people they're 30 40 yeah. uh, i think also some of the venues are limiting the numbers as well mm. But you have got big plans for the future. Uh, I mean, you talk about pubs, clubs, bars, yeah. but airlines, hotels, hamper yeah. companies as That's right. well. Um, um, there's been a lot of gifting. Uh, this seems to yeah. be the thing last year and this year. We are working with several hamper companies that uh, have got a lovely range of food and goodies and all sorts of things where they can introduce our cocktails. It seems to be working very well. Uh, There's a company in Essex we're working very well with, the various others. And I think that if we can continue this way, then we will grow. We've got we've got to grow. We can't stop. We need to talk to more wholesalers. And I can say a little bit of good news. We're in a very large department store in Norwich, begins with a J, uh, but we won't go any further. (laughs) Oh, how exciting. I can imagine. I can see these on airlines as well. I can definitely uh, see this. They are actually going to be in Virgin Airlines next year. Uh, obviously, yeah. couldn't be this, they couldn't, couldn't be this year because they only started no. flying three weeks ago, didn't yeah. they, two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, they approached us last year and said, great, um, like the product. And, of course, no planes were going anywhere. So we'll, we'll just see. They've uh, made the commitment. And uh, trains, that was something. That was, was it one of the MPs was having a gin and tonic on her way back home? And that caught, yes. um, caught people's eyes. So I thought, well, if they can do it, why can't we? <laughs> well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Bob, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And congratulations, Bob, as well. Virgin is an amazing... Fabulous news, isn't it? I know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite quiet as well. But, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, really great news. So, yeah, right. Well, thank you to everybody. Thank you to you four and to everybody um, else that's taken part. And obviously um, to Georgie as well again. Um, so Amanda James just said thank you. Um, 
what a great second session. So um, another well done there. Um, oh, so awesome. does anyone have any questions that they'd like, either for you lot, um, to, to each other or anyone from the audience? Um, again, you can either use the Q&A button if you'd like to type it or you can use the raised hand if you'd like to join us on stage and take the microphone. Oh, we've got a volunteer. Right. Um, David. Um, <clears throat> can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you fine, yeah. I, I didn't know if I was muted. Um, no, uh, a, a, a question for Emma. Um, we have, um, uh, I've, I've got to be a bit careful here. We have been um, asked to intervene in, um, in shall we say, cyberbullying and cyber incursion uh, uh, affecting uh, families. Do do you ever find that this uh, we we we're, we're not social workers, and uh, but but we can help intercede between the families and the police and social services and the school. Uh, it, the, the particular case I'm thinking of involved a young lady and uh, a chap who was a thoroughly inappropriate uh, person. Um, if if we ever came to a situation like that in future. Could we direct them to you, or, or what? What would we? What's, I'm not sure that we did our best. That was all. Um, we're IT specialists, you see. So. so generally, what I would say is it kind of varies. But so I'm more business to business, more organisational rather than the one to one support. Reason being of um, therapeutic boundary. So we're not therapists, so we're very careful in how we do that as kind of support workers. And now transitioning into private work myself, it's. Um, support for you guys and how to respond i would be able to deal with that if you are looking at getting support for people on the end of the bullying then that would be probably more support services if so for example if it was sexual in nature then there's sexual violence services i can signpost you to if it's domestic yeah. violence in nature then there's domestic violence services if yes, it's it was it, it was more associated with revenge pornography and, and things like yeah. this if you, if you see what i'm saying and our, basically what we did was got it all taken down and stopped and so that everyone could take a breather but anyway yeah. sorry yeah does that help well revenge porn is is massive and it's a really underrepresented type of sexual violence and people don't see it as violent but it causes people complex trauma response in the same way um as many sexual assaults that are directly physical would have so the fact that you managed to get it taken down is incredible because that will have really supported the survivor to feel safe and from a signposting perspective, actually, if you came across those sorts of things, then if it's something, for example, that happens in, and you know where the county is, then you can signpost them to a sexual assault referral centre. So oh, in right. Suffolk, that would be The Ferns, which is F-E-R-N-S. Okay. Um, and they would be able to support the survivor, whether that's engaging in the police process, whether that's just about getting um, an ISFAS, that's a role that I used to have. And that would be a targeted support worker who can help that person to kind of unpack the trauma for themselves, access yeah. therapeutic input. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely ways you can do that. Obviously, if you want to, I'll put my email in the chat if you want me just to link you the number for the ferns and kind of send you some other services and I can do. I'll, I'll find them. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm good at that. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Right. We've had something... Oh, good one from Amanda Jane here. Um, right, Bob, congratulations again, great work. Um, but what is your favourite cocktail? I guess my favourite cocktail is a Mai Tai. Um, if you can get it made with the proper Caribbean rum, a light rum, a dark rum, a little bit of um, almond syrup, orange carousel and lime, just uh, just shake it all other than the dark rum in a nice shaker. Pour it in, put your garnish in, and then just sprinkle your dark rum on top so it all filters through. Oh, <laughs> just something else. <laughs> That's Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Um, right, and another one for Emma. Do you ever feel lonely now that you've gone it alone? Um... I suppose in some ways, like it's, um, I'm quite introverted. So like, I, I'm a bit of a contra contradiction when I say it, but I'm like a really sociable introvert in the sense that like, I like to recharge and be alone. So like I do my best work um, kind of early in the morning by myself when I'm in the zone and then I go to people if I need it. But 
I think the pandemic has probably helped with that, ironically, because we spent like 18 months working kind of quite remotely, whereas we've been in the office amongst people. But um, I think because the nature of the work is quite sensitive, it makes it easier to deal with that by myself. And because I've this is going to sound ridiculous, but I've got dogs in the house. So it doesn't feel as isolated because my home is my office. So actually... I can go and if I'm like feeling a bit isolated, I'll just go take the dogs for a walk and actually then I get amongst people and then people will talk to me and actually it kind of makes it feel less isolated. But there are definitely days where I miss the um, kind of dynamic of just bouncing ideas off of someone. So it's not kind of like lonely, but it is a bit isolating sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Right, James. Yeah, can I just add something to that? Um, I mean, one of the really big problems about running your own business and particularly if you're in financial difficulty is you are alone who are you going to speak to well you're not going to speak to your bank manager because you certainly don't want to worry them that you're in the financial difficulty do you want to speak to your partner about it well again probably not you can't speak to your employees about it because you don't want to scare them so actually it's quite important to have somebody as a sounding board to help you it can be very very lonely running your own business um, and uh, having somebody that uh, uh, understands that and, and can work with you makes a big difference. Thank you. Right. Um, and on that note, Roger's just said, Emma, join these while we do support each other. But Emma has actually just joined these while this month. So so welcome aboard. <laughs> so well done, she's now part of, part of ISPA. And um, yeah, so that's one of the things ISPA was originally started for was to... Um, to offer that mutual support among peers and businesses and other people that might be experiencing the same thing that you are. So, um, so yeah, that's all good. And we are literally down to our last three minutes in this session here. So um, Amanda James just said, thanks, Georgie. As vice chair of Isbar, we thank you for all of your support to Isbar and for my random shout, shout outs on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Bless her, she so, often <laughs> messaged me on a Saturday morning and she's in the car and I gave her a shout out. She's still on some kind of adventure. So that's lovely. Oh. No, it's my pleasure. It's always fascinating meeting you all and chatting to you about your different businesses as well, because it's really 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 interesting really interesting yeah. chats tonight such a diverse group yeah, and different been. types of business yeah mm. but thank you from us as well because um you know you've done a fantastic job as always and thank you for coming back and um hopefully we'll have you back again next year if you'll oh. if you'll come so um, yeah no i'd yeah. love to and hopefully we'll be in person hopefully yeah hopefully we'll next be in year. person and um, yeah yeah fingers crossed yeah be nice. there. Right, so we've got a bit more time for some networking, um, just a good time. So, yeah, so pop back to the lounge, um, have some chats and things, and then Graham will be back towards the end just to close the event and um, and add an ears for a bit. So um, we've got all oh, something in the chat here. I'll just see what that is. All right, brilliant. Yep, yeah, Kim's just said technology will work very well and well done to Maria and all the attendees, speakers, and to Georgie. So oh, <laughs> thanks, thank Kim. Kim. Thanks, Kim. Brilliant. Okay, so um, yep. So I will leave you with our final countdown here. I'll end this session, and then um, we will see you all in the lounge in a moment. <laughs> thank you.